what? Mm. I heard a clatter. What, right, Charlie? There, a clatter. Charlie, what are you talking about? I don't know. It came a big noise. It's coming from outside. Charlie, it's just the wind or something. Come on, let's go back to bed. Somebody's on the roof. Maybe it's Sansa. Not now, Charlie. I want you to sit here, and I want you to stay right there. Charlie, do you know how to call 911? Sure, 911. Yeah, great. Stay there. Charlie, stay where you are. Charlie, would you listen to me? Stay up there. He is Santa. You killed him. I did not. And he's not Santa. Well, he was. He's got some ID on him, I bet. Fella, if you can hear me, I'm just looking for identification. Once you figure out who you are, I'll, I'll give you a lift back to the mall. If something should happen to me, put on my suit, the reindeer will know what to do. Yeah, right. absolutely resisted doing uh, for weeks or months or perhaps even years because you don't want to because it's uncomfortable or he is perhaps pushing you or calling you to bear more fruit present in front of your family in front of your co-workers in front of your other relationships I want to look at the book of Ephesians today uh, starting with Ephesians chapter 2 the Apostle Paul to the Church of Ephesus uh, starts off in Ephesians chapter 2 by drawing a really specific contrast. He did this throughout many of his letters. Ephesians chapter 2 says, uh, You were dead in trespasses and sin, which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul describes a, a pretty icky picture, right? That, that without Christ, B.C., before Christ, whether you became a Christian as a, as a little kid or a grown-up or whether you're a Sunday school teacher or an accountant, this was your lot in life. That, that you were slave to the sons of disobedience, you kind of gave yourself over to to whatever you wanted, to wrath, to the, the prince of the power of darkness. And that, that's an icky picture, but that's kind of the equalizer for all of us in that we were born in that condition. But verse 4 presents one of the greatest phrases in Scripture that's repeated over and over, but God. This was the bad thing, this was the awful thing, this was the sin thing, but God. Being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. Romans 5, 8 that we looked at last week said, while we were sinners, while we were dead in our trespasses, Christ died for us. Made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, verse 8, through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. 
Not a result of work, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he paints this extreme contrast of this is what life looks like without Christ. Given over to the powers of darkness, given over to your own stuff, your own wrath, your own iniquity, but God did something. So that you could be different. And, and he did it not, not through anything you did. Not through works. Because God knows people. And you know people. And if it was something we could achieve on our own. We would as the Bible says. We would boast in it. You know I kind of pulled myself up by my bootstraps. And I conquered this whole salvation thing. And the Bible says it was through God's grace and mercy. That you were given this gift. And it was for a purpose. It was for good works. You become his workmanship, and the, and the word there uh, means his artistry, his masterpiece. You become the best thing God ever did for the purpose of good works, prepared before you even knew about them, so that you could walk in them. Because of what Jesus has done, and because of what Jesus did, you can be different. And you can have peace with the really difficult things that, that God pushes us and prods us and the Holy Spirit nudges us toward because of this extreme contrast. So in this movie, in the, in the Santa Claus, uh, Scott Calvin puts on the suit. He, he gets in the sleigh. He actually spends the night uh, touring the world in the sleigh. And he ends up on the North Pole. Let's take a look. I am not Santa Claus. Ah. Did you or did you not read the card? Yeah, I read the card. Then you're the new Santa. In putting on the hat and jacket, you accepted the contract. What contract? The card in the Santa suit. You said you read it, right? So when you put on the suit, he fell subject to the Santa Claus. Here. The Santa Claus? Oh, you mean the guy that fell off my roof? No, no, no. Not Santa Claus the person. Santa Claus the clause. What? You're a businessman, right? Yeah. Okay. A clause, as in the last line of a contract. You got the card. Yeah. Okay, look. The Santa Claus. And putting on the suit and entering the sleigh, the wearer waves any and all rights to any previous identity, real or implied, oh. and fully accepts the duties and responsibilities of Santa Claus in perpetuity until such time that wearer becomes unable to do so by either accident or design. What does that mean? It means you put on the suit, you're the big guy. It's ridiculous. The Santa Claus, which says, putting on the suit, entering the sleigh, the wearer waves any and all rights to any previous identity, real or implied. This practically preaches itself. <laughs> the Apostle Paul says it a little differently in Ephesians chapter 4, just a couple chapters over, says, Ephesians 4.17 says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, to practice every kind of impurity. And then again, the contrast. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, that is to say, assuming you are not ignorant, as the people he just described, as the truth is in Jesus, to have put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Bernard the Elf says, you put on the suit, you're the guy. Paul the Apostle says, you have put on Christ. Walk like it. He says that there is just simply a stark difference in the way that you operate when you take off the old self and you put on Christ. There is a stark difference in the way that you live your life, in your attitude, in your habits. And he compares in both passages... He compares that to some pretty dark stuff. Ignorant Gentiles that have given themselves over to sensuality and people that serve the prince of the power of darkness. And, and 
that seems harsh, but it's always contrasted with, but Christ, but God. Look at how different things can be because you put on Christ. This is the classic struggle between having Jesus as your Savior or your Lord. Jesus as your Savior brings you peace with God, reconciles you to God because of what Jesus did for us. Jesus as your Lord paints him as your master, as the one who dictates your steps and your path. And let's face it, we want God to save us, but we don't want God to boss us around. Because I can't have peace with that stuff. It's hard. Giving up that stuff is hard. Pursuing God's will is hard. You will not have peace with God without Christ. But even as a Christian, you will not have peace with what God is doing if you are trying to walk in your old self. The Bible says you have to put on the new self. The Bible says you have to put on Christ. We have peace with God through Christ. We have peace with what God is doing through submission to Christ's lordship. And we can even have peace with others. Now, when we think about peace with others, we think, okay, just uh, everybody gets along, right? It's just try not to cause any problems. And, you know, I won't bother you. You don't bother me. And we will have peace. But it's painted a little bit differently in the, in the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verse 10. God's word says, I am now seeking the approval of man or God. Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So it's actually the way to have peace with others is to recognize others are not who you are serving. All throughout this movie, uh, Scott Calvin starts to go through this transformation. And some of it is very comical because it's physical. And he starts to look like Santa Claus. He, like, he starts to put on weight regardless of how much he exercises. And he starts to grow a beard and he shaves it off and he grows it back. And his hair starts to turn gray. And he blames everything. There must be something wrong with the scale. There must be something wrong with the mirror. But the only time that he had peace with other people at the end of the movie, and when we're talking other people, we're talking work associates, we're talking about his ex-wife, we're talking about his son's new stepdad. The only time he had peace with those people is when he finally recognized and leaned into what he was being called to be. And that is so true for us. Peace with others oftentimes is, is not so much about the arguments you have with other people. It is about leaning into the lordship of Jesus Christ. And it becomes so noticeable that it leads to peace with others. This was on display in the early church in a, in a huge way. And when you read the first half dozen chapters of Acts or so, uh, you just see men that were so emboldened by the resurrection and people that had been with Jesus and they saw Jesus crucified and they saw Jesus rose again, and boom, the early church took off because of that boldness. And two of these, these preachers were Peter and John, disciples that had been with Jesus, and they preached in the temple. They preached and pointed their finger at the same people that had Jesus executed, and they said, you killed him, and God raised him from the dead, and you need to repent. And they, just, they had this boldness, but they had this peace because they, they didn't care what others could do to them. They went to jail and got out and went to jail and got out. And there's this, this really neat verse in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. It says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, we're talking about the temple folks, we're talking about the folks that saw them preach. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now, this is not a compliment. Uh, if you look up the Greek word for common men, it is idiota. That's a true story. Uh, it's the word that we get for idiot. Um, so being a common man was not a compliment. They look at me like, look, they're fishermen. They smell. They're certainly not educated. But look at their boldness. They've been with Jesus. There's no other explanation for it. And I believe that the reality check, the spiritual reality check that we have to make individually, that the church collectively has to make from time to time, is would anyone ever accuse you of having been with Jesus? Would anyone ever look at, at the way you live your life, the way you interact with your, 
your family, the way you interact with your employees or your employers? Would anyone look at your checkbook register or the way you expend your resources and would they accuse you of having an experience with Jesus? Because if the world looks at you as an individual and doesn't see Jesus, or if the world looks at the church certainly and doesn't see Jesus, then we have failed somewhere in having peace with what God is doing in us. See, once Santa Claus dies and Scott Calvin became Santa Claus, spoiler alert, by the way, when Santa falls off the roof, he dies. Um, Once Santa Claus dies and Scott Calvin becomes Santa Claus, and, and the reality is to have peace with God, Jesus had to die. But for you to have peace with what God is doing, you have to die. The Bible mentions over and over that, that we have to die to ourselves. And we cannot approach our faith, we cannot approach our, our spiritual journey with our own stuff, our own plans. God, you know, I, I want to have peace with what you're doing, but let me tell you what I'm doing. You will never have peace with that because that's a little bit of the old self. That's a little bit of the old way of thinking. So my statement to you today, first and foremost, is if, if you don't have peace with God, if you've never surrendered yourself to, to Jesus and what he's done for you, you can have peace with God simply because of the gift of Christmas. Simply because God stepped into the world in human flesh, modeled and taught a perfect life, died for your sins, defeated death, and said, follow me. You can have peace with God simply because of what Jesus did for you, and you can have that today. For those of us who have made that decision, we know that we have peace with God. We know that we're going to go to heaven when we die and that we've been reconciled to God. Sometimes there's still not peace in our life because we resist. We resist what God is calling us to do. We resist that next step of faith maybe God is pushing us to because we don't have peace with that. It's uncomfortable. It makes us nervous. It makes us scared. But you can have peace with that. Paul gained peace through it by by this extreme contrast that he understood to be between the B.C. life, the before Christ life, and the new self. So we often have to evaluate, does the world see Jesus when they look at us? Would they accuse you of having been with Jesus if they saw what you did? If they saw what you don't do, would they accuse us of being with Jesus? The song that we're going to use at the end of the service today uses imagery that is familiar to us. We, we use quite a bit, and it's the image of a, of a potter. The clay submits itself to the potter's hand and to the potter's wheel. And that's not a peaceful set of circumstances sometimes. The clay has to be molded. The clay has to be kneaded. The clay has to be pounded. And the clay has to be in the fire. It's uncomfortable. But in the potter's hand, something beautiful is created. His workmanship, something created for a purpose far beyond a lump of clay. And so our prayer today is that we all submit ourselves to the potter's hand. That our prayer be, God, give me peace with whatever it is you're doing in my life. And if I've been resistant to it, give me peace with it. If if it's pushing me maybe outside my comfort zone, give me peace with that. If there's just maybe something I need to let go of, that is that that spiritual uh, bondage of Egypt that they talk about in the Old Testament, give me peace with that. There are things I can say no to that I couldn't say no to before because... The Prince of Peace is present in the world. So I'd invite you to stand. We're going to sing this song through a couple of times. This is a time of time of response, a time of reflection, and certainly a time of prayer. If you have a prayer need today that you would like to pray about, our altars are open. You can kneel right up here. You can pray at your seat. You can pray with one of our pastors that will be up here. But do we submit ourselves to what God is doing, and do we have peace with Because we are his workmanship. Jesus came to save you. Jesus came so that you could be reconciled to the Father. But Jesus came to change you. To where your life would be lived on display and others would look at it and say, they've been with Jesus. Something is different about that. Let's sing it.